And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, the man, the man who, men, who many may know as the speaker, but, he had, but at least he answers questions. And 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 um and the head of the Destiny tabletop RPG, the one and only Anthony Tebow. How you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me in your monastery. <laughs> thanks for thanks for com thanks for coming in. Yeah, I had to get at least one. I had to get get at least one speaker joke out of my system. Oh, that's okay. Especially I make them all the time. Yeah, especially since um. A friend of mine has been trying to talk me into cosplaying as the speaker because of my height. Yeah, I uh, I would love, I would kill for a speaker mask in real life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure I could find a prop maker to do it, but it ain't going to come cheap, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Now taking that into taking that into account, now, obviously there are normally there's a case of ju oh, just a standard couple and how it intersects, but in this case there's multiple origins that have to be accounted for. Yeah, um, that's true. So I'll start with the first one, given given what you're actually working on. What was your introduction to role playing games, and could you tell me about what was it that made it stick for you? Uh, like my first ever role playing game. I'm specifically referring to your first ever tabletop role playing game, so we don't so we don't delve into yeah. the video game end of things because that's a whole other. No problem. Uh, my first tabletop role playing game was introduced to me uh, by my dad when I was in school. Uh, he introduced me to Palladium's Rifts first. Oh, oh god! <laughs> oh god! Uh, and the the prospect of being whatever I wanted, whatever I could think of, uh, and making that be a thing really struck with me. Uh, I have tried to run rifts in more recent times, and I cannot stand running it because of the total lack of balance in the system. Uh, but it definitely grabbed me at a young age and pulled me right into the scene. I'd I'd imagine trying to run I'd imagine trying to run rifts you probably you probably ended up pulling your hair out just trying to navigate the books. Oh yeah, I have uh I have a huge collection of them physically and then I have uh most of them scanned digitally uh and I can you know control F to find certain things if I need to but it doesn't make everything better really. Mm -hmm. Um that's not that's not too much of a surprise, and th and you can imagine you can imagine my particular bout of laughter when after twenty after twenty plus years of Kevin C and Beta um, spur spurning any attempt to try and convert his work into other systems, we finally get a Rift's adaptation in Savage Worlds. Yeah, absolutely insane. And part of the reason I say that is he um what he was extremely adamant about not about um going after anybody who tried to adapt it into say D twenty in the early two thousands. Yeah. Not that a, not that a um D twenty riffs would have been all that good, but st no, but still. not everything needs to be D twenty. That's sort of a, a foundational concept that when people come to us uh, in the Destiny system, they go. Uh, why isn't this D twenty? Well, I've got a list of reasons why we're using fate dice specifically. Yeah, um, I'll get I'll get to I'll get to the fate thing in in a second. So hold, so hold that. Thought. Yeah, but I will. The second is what was what was your introduction to Destiny as far as the video game? I mean, was it was it was it just something you stumbled upon? Were you familiar with with Bungie during the um, Halo or even during the marathon days? Or or was there a different route? Uh, I became familiar with uh, Halo very early on. I never, I have still never played Marathon or Mythic, 
uh, despite actually wanting to. I've just never dedicated the time to figuring that out. Um, be very uh, care. Be very. If you end up getting uh, myth, if you end up getting, I think it was Mythic Two. Be very careful which one you get because of an unfortunate bug that happened with one version of them. Okay. Um. It should. It sh if you're if you're getting it off if you're getting it off um, digitally, it shouldn't be a problem. But if you're getting it from a pl from an I from an ISO, um, that one that might be a little bit more cause for concern. Uh, I'm more likely to get it digitally anyway, so that's uh, it's good to know anyway. All right. Um, and since I'm guessing, since you since you got introduced with Halo, I'm guessing you started all the way back with Combat Evolved. Uh, yeah, I did. I uh, I was in school, uh, and I had a, a buddy that talked about Halo all the time, and so we uh, I used to go to his place to play mm -hmm. Halo, uh, and then. Halo 2, I did co-op with my brother, start to finish. Uh, we redid Halo 1, uh, Combat Evolved, start to finish. So uh, it became something that was very ingrained in me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when Bungie announced Destiny, that they were leaving the Halo franchise, uh, I was sad that Halo was going, but I was very excited to try something new, something fresh. And uh, I've been stuck with Destiny since it came out. Mm -hmm. through, all, through all the ups and downs and... Especially the downs and downs yeah. and downs with Destiny Two. No kidding. No kidding. Um, to the point where to the point where on my show Destiny Two for a period of about I want to say three and a half months was my personal whipping boy. And it wasn't uh, that, it wasn't out of anything malicious. It was. I think that I I like to com the. Those particular days where they where they could where they were very bad at supporting. I like to describe those days as a very messy divorce. Yeah. Or like the like the couple the couple that's arguing, you know that they're gonna get get a divorce eventually. It's just a matter of when are they gonna sign the papers. Yeah, it's it was uh, a horrendous time for Destiny. It's still I mean, Destiny's not doing great right now as far as I'm concerned, but uh I still love Destiny, I still love Bungie and I will continue supporting them for the foreseeable future what I, what i think you're gonna see out of what you're what you're slowly seeing is that it, i think they're trying to um trying to build trying to build build up rapport before they do any anything major yeah um basic basically basically put the, basically go go down the same route that warframe has gone where that game is ha has such as built up such rapport with its fan base that when warframe does screw up when digital extremes does screw up um it the uh, blow isn't as hard. Yeah. Um. Uh, I can definitely see that. Yeah. And s since you since you since you mentioned Halo, I will I will ask: Were you one of the people foolish enough to try doing Halo Two on Legendary? I have <laughs> beat Halo Two on Legendary. Yes. And I say foolish because well, you know exactly where I'm aiming. Oh, I know. <laughs> It was foolish. And it was a long time ago at this point. I don't think I could do it now. I can still I can still do it. I just choose not to because yeah. I don't care for the notion of handbreaking. I uh I fully understand where you're coming from. Um and it's funny you mentioned com it's funny that we brought up Combat Evolved earlier because um of some of some of the interesting mods that people have done with Halo Custom, like Glass or especially SPV3. I'm not familiar. SPV3 is it's a, is a very extent is a very extensive mod of Halo Custom Edition that bring that brings in some brings in some elements from the later games, especially ODST and Reach. And brings in a lot of the weaponry from them, as well as adding some of its own tweaks. Well, that would be really cool, because uh, Reach is probably, despite what they did to the lore, as I have read most of the Halo books as well, I have a Halo tattoo, mm -hmm. uh, Reach is probably my favorite of the Halo games, and ODST is another really good one. I like, bo I like both, although... Um... When it comes when it comes to reach, I am in the I'm in the category that the armor abilities were a bad idea. Um, it's largely because I felt I felt like too many of them undercut 
um, established mechanics. Yeah, and I can understand that. Um, because with with Halo th- with Halo three and four, and even with the ones that three four three has tried to do, there was this idea of trying to introduce a extra pillar to the Trinity. And you had with the ones that Bungie did, you had two extremes: equipment in three, which I didn't miss when it when it wasn't there. Yeah, me neither. And armor abilities and reach, which is on the opposite end of things. And uh, yeah, I I preferred the armor abilities by a lot to the equipment. Uh, there were some armor abilities that I would uh, never miss in a hundred years. Armor lock comes to mind. Yeah. I look at armor lock as a get out of jail free card. Yeah. Also, also, um, I do, th- I do think that, ev- that um, every every one of the Halo games has that one infamous weapon, like the, like the way the pistol was for the original, and for um, for the for Reach. To me, I'm not sure if you had the same experience, but for me, the uh, weapon that was ca- that could be could be abused very easily was the DMR. Yes, I abused the hell out of the DMR. <laughs> um, although I'd say that's largely because of how the maps are designed, more than anything else. But when it now, what spark what sparked the whole trying to make a uh, tabletop game out of Destiny? Uh, well, it was a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Destiny, the tabletop role-playing game, has only on paper existed for uh, a few years, but uh, ideas for it started rolling around in uh, the later days of Destiny 1, even probably er as early as uh, Taken King, where they had established a whole lot of lore and world building that was super fascinating, super cool, uh, but there was no ability to explore it because so much of it is put in these lore cards that Bungie is so fond of doing nowadays. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the fundamental reason that uh, Destiny Tabletop started being developed was to allow people to explore this universe that Bungie was putting out uh, and while we were still being allowed to explore it in the video game, there's a certain freedom to being able to transmat to your starship and go to uh, an unexplored forest in Venus uh, and uh, running into rogue guardians that may or may not be out to get you that are hinted at in the Destiny lore but you never actually see them. You'll see a scorch mark of a guardian that got killed by a guy with a golden gun, and that's as close as you get to mortal peril from your own. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think the, I think, I think something, something else that, that all, that to me always hint, always hinted at lore was, I remember before, Destiny came out, and I was going through the wiki and going through the visual references and visual inspirations that they had, not just for not just for the Guardians, but also for the different enemy factions. And a lot of the naming conv- convention, the f- the fact the fact that you have the um you have the bi- you have the beefy guys in the Cabal, you have the uh, you have the um. Essentially, undead, no, undead nobility with the hive, and so and so on. Plus the, um, plus the different houses, which one of them did be a, was a focus in DLC. But you only, you only really see the House of Devils, and then later on the House of Wolves, and that's it. Like yeah, like, there's uh, you see some of the houses, uh, in represented in places but even like the house of devils you run into at the beginning of the first destiny and then you see them in the siva expansion in rise of iron uh basically totally different uh you don't you can read a lot about 
their hierarchy and you can read about what's going on in their house, but you only encounter them a couple of times as a player, as opposed to the kind of freedom you get with a, a tabletop role-playing game where you could, I mean, if you run into a Kel in the video game, you're going to fight, but there are regular conversations between guardians and these uh, fallen, the Elixni, mm-hmm. uh, that you read about, and it's something you can't explore unless you're properly in a role-playing environment. And that brings that brings me to the, that brings me to a question that you, we um kind of we kind of touched on earlier, but I'd like to dive in on. And that is the fact that you are using um fudge dice. I know I know that it would be temp I w- I know that it's tempting to refer to them as fate dice in this case, but I yeah I really can't simply because of the fact that even though you're using the same dice with a very similar dice system. This does not this does not strike me in any stretch as a fate game. That's correct. We use the fate dice or the fudge dice. Mm-hmm. Uh but we are we started this system, we built it from the ground up. I have seen this uh and been involved with this project while uh we were using feet to measure distance. We are now in uh 1 meter units. Uh the system has evolved uh a lot over time and uh a number of years ago we might have been more open to using a different type of dice uh but the fate or fudge dice are something we've settled on for uh five main reasons uh the first reason is the uh, bell curve that's associated with it Mm -hmm. Uh, you have a higher chance of rolling a zero than a one or a negative one uh So it winds up, the skills you invest in wind up being more valuable uh, because you'll be an actually better shot than like Dungeons and Dragons D20 where if you're trying to make a a stealth check, you've got a flat bonus to it. Uh, The second reason we use the fudge dice is because it's as accessible as possible for new players to tabletop role-playing games. Most of our uh, target demographic has played Destiny, the video game, uh, and Fudge Dice are six-sided. You can find them in Monopoly or Munchkin or whatever board game you've got lying around. Mm -hmm. Uh, They've got two blanks, two pluses, and two minuses. So uh, even if you don't want to go to the store and invest in dice or you don't want to use a bot to roll your dice... Most people have a D6 lying around their house, uh, which can be then used to roll fudge dice. And it's something something I should something I should note, especially since you guys are still using the success ladder, is within Fate there was a um, there was a alternative approach that was suggested, but with but with a caveat warning of this might re- result in a bit of swingy. And that is rolling two d six and take and doing the feng shui approach of one positive, one negative. Was that a was that an approach you guys ever t- you guys ever tested? And what and um what were the takeaways if you did? Well, uh, we roll four d six for almost everything mm-hmm. in our system. So uh, you've it averages out to that zero easier. Uh, I don't know that we tested 2d6. It's possible that Steven did, and uh, I never heard anything about it. Uh, But since we have been a uh, fate-fudge-based system, uh, I haven't rolled anything but fours for the average roll, or uh, 3d6 or 3DF plus 1 or minus 1 for advantage, disadvantage, mm-hmm. uh, or the odd uh, 1DF for very niche circumstances. Yeah. And when it came when when it came to set, when it came to setting up the pillars that you guys had in mind 
for for adapting Destiny to ta to tabletop, what were some what were some of the things from the games that you wanted to keep, and what were some of the things you wanted to try and avoid? Uh, that has been a real struggle uh, throughout development is balancing uh, tabletop versus video game. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really important to us because Bungie has done a really, really, really good job at gunplay in Destiny that our guns feel like they would in the video game. And I think for the most part, we have done that relatively successfully uh one of the biggest struggles for translating from the video game to the tabletop has been abilities and super abilities mm -hmm. because in the destiny lore there's a lot of uh subtle references to th things we can do with the light uh that we never see or uh whatever else so making the tabletop, we wind up with a system of math that uh, is ever-changing. Uh, until recently, uh, all supers had the same ability pool as your regular abilities, which included throwing grenades. Uh, it was probably last year, a little less than a year ago, that we separated super abilities to a, a rest while keeping abilities uh, as a thing, and then uh, I'm going to be changing ability points again in the next update so that everybody has more access to them and it's harder to uh, harder for warlocks to abuse that uh, ab that pool mm -hmm. uh, but some of the things we've had to avoid uh, I in the rule book right now have a block of text about ghost hacking. Uh, it is clunky. It doesn't work. And uh, I hate it. It was something that I wanted to incorporate from the video game. Because your ghost goes up to hack something. And then uh, maybe he trips an alarm. And uh, you fight waves of enemies until he's done hacking. Uh, it was something I thought would be cool to have a, a mechanic that reflected that in the tabletop, but it just straight up doesn't work. Uh, it would It's better set up as a, a mechanic uh, that a speaker would set up in an encounter, a game master would mm -hmm. set up in an encounter, rather than just a, a hard mechanical thing that definitely happens if you do it a specific way. Yeah. And... Obviously, one of the e one of the easy things to say absolutely no to that's in the video game that isn't going to work is well, for one, um, having e having e having everything be um, be gun focused. That's one of those things yeah. you can do in a vid. That's one of the things you kind of have to do in a video game, but you don't necessarily have to do with a, a tabletop. Yeah, I uh, in one of the campaigns that I ran uh, since we're still in beta, uh, the character was a lot different than they would be now if they were built but uh the player built a warlock that was uh resurrected in her past life she was a monk so she didn't focus on gunplay at all she had the guns but she was more focused on abilities that controlled melee manipulation and mm -hmm. uh engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with things uh which is a huge difference from the video game because the best we've got is uh, a punch or a ranged punch or maybe a knife throw. Yeah, um, I mean we got they got slight they got slightly better at it when the Taken King came around, but not yeah. by much. And it's and to be fair, their history, um, Bungie's history with melee weapons. Has ent has entailed the has entailed the one hit kill that was the energy sword, um, and not and not a whole lot else. It's not yeah it's the not like, the one hit kill uh, gravity hammer too. Mm -hmm. I mean it's it's not like I mean melee is part is part of the holy trinity, but it um, but its importance is is not as pronounced. Yeah. 
and and then you know you have to be able to be a, a smooth talking sob uh, as well in a tabletop role playing yeah. game if you want to, which is impossible in the video game. Look, every is that is that make is that you trying to make a sl a sly reference out? Everybody wants to be Cade. Uh, it may be a reference to that. Yeah, everybody loved Cade. Uh, I think it's a good thing for story progression that he's not around anymore but uh probably probably because you you'd end up ha you'd end up having the jack sparrow problem where the supporting guy ends up outshining the main guy yeah um uh. and the the and the funny thing is there are there are cer there are certain subclasses that where I look at them and go, you should not be th you should not be wielding guns. Yeah. Um, the big one uh, the big one for me was the sunbreaker. <laughs> yeah, wielding the the hammer. It would be so much cooler if the whole kit was about the the hammers and the uh, the forging idea, mm -hmm. melee manipulation all the way. But uh, we got sunspots with sunbreakers. Yeah. You can stand and fire and shoot. And taking that into account, would you would you say that um <clears throat> would you say would you say that you've taken more notes from Destiny one or two in terms of your overall design? I think we have done a, a pretty good job of being relatively balanced. Uh, we have incorporated every super from Destiny 1 and Destiny 2, except for uh, the Radiance super from Destiny 1's Warlocks. Mm -hmm. uh, though we haven't incorporated it for different reasons than it was disincluded from Destiny 2. Uh, it winds up being that we have uh, we've tried to make a cohesive Destiny universe work uh despite sort of the the clear differences between destiny 1 and destiny 2 uh destiny 1 uh there was a huge power play issue where everybody had uh unlimited abilities that's something we don't want to see in our tabletop we like uh, a lower power thing if you can go into a room nuke everything with grenades uh move into the next room nuke everything with grenades and never have any risk of uh, running out of power like you can in the video game, the tabletop would be a whole lot more boring. So mm -hmm. everybody has been uh, scaled back in power from the video game. You're not the Guardian. You are Taco 3. Yeah, and the th it's, already, it's already clear that, there's, that there are other Guardians in the game, so try... So, um, you, can't ha you can't have everyone be the chosen one, otherwise nobody is. Exactly. Um, but when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the three class trinity of of guardians, now in the video game there's been there's been a bit of an issue for a long time where one of them ends up outshining the others or just or just gets complete get, gets some um, completely buried within 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 the balancing. Like for the longest time, um, titans. Were the were the one that got screwed over the most because everybody everybody was go everybody was going with warlock. Um, has that been an issue that you guys have had during testing, where it seems that one class has um too much of an advantage over others? Uh, yeah. Uh, mathematically, uh, it's difficult to uh, account for everything. Mm hmm. Right now, Titans are stronger than Warlocks or Hunters. Uh, only by a little bit. And I'm bringing them back a little bit uh, for the next update that I'm working on. Uh, I think for a long time in development, uh, Hunters had the upper hand, but I think they're in a pretty good place now. Uh, Warlocks are going to be in a, a pretty good place once I've got uh, the abilities with... Uh, Disconnecting abilities from the intellect stat mm -hmm. a little bit. I think warlocks will be back in line where they should be. Uh, and titans right now can theoretically hit the hardest out of everybody. Uh, someone did math the other night and showed uh, 
a rank 10, which is the highest rank in our, our tabletop game, uh, Hunter can hit for like 79 if they did uh, all things correctly. Uh, and a Titan can hit for 128. So uh, that's a, a huge difference, especially when almost nothing has that kind of hit point value. That does bring me to another thing. the the whole The whole notion of of just throwing around grenades or throwing around the nukes as much as you can there is a there is a term for that I see in a lot of parlance called Nova. Has that happened during playtest where somebody um, holds off all their all their as much of their stuff as they can and then just unloads on a boss or b bag equivalent? Of course, it has. Uh, I have done that in playtesting just. Uh, I don't do it anymore. I just did it the once for fun. Uh, but we have seen all sorts of uh, variations on the Nova. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a guy who built a character whose express purpose was to travel in the upward direction uh, during development. Uh, so it's really easy to hold off all your weapons and stuff to, to blow up the boss at the end, and it happens... Uh, relatively frequently i think because uh players like to do that sort of thing they get afraid of expending resources but this one uh guy built the character with the express purpose of traveling up he read through the whole rule book and he found every single way he could find viable to argue that he should be allowed to travel in an up direction so we had to patch a bunch of things uh like shade step previously allowed you to move in any open space uh so he had spent a bunch of ability points on shade step traveling up he used his double jump to travel up and i think he traveled it was a, an enormous distance i'd have to look back on it but uh he traveled an unreasonable distance up high enough that he had no way of recovering his character would have died on impact with the ground but it was worth it because he had broken the system mm -hmm. and to be fair when playtesting that's kind of what you want to see is people try and break exactly things. i am thrilled when i see people do that kind of math yeah um now one one thing that i one thing that i saw that uh, made that did give me a bit of a laugh is because of the way you've got it the way you've got it set up um Play, what, the choice of someone playing a human, a awoken, or an or an exo actually matters here. <laughs> yes, uh, it was another thing. Looking at Destiny uh, and reading their lore, uh, it didn't make sense to not have those sort of important decisions brought into the tabletop role playing game. Mm -hmm. uh, Petra Venge uh, is an awoken who works for the Reef. She's not even a guardian. Uh, she doesn't have access to a ghost like we do, and yet she can still levitate a knife with her hand. She has access to the Traveler's Light, or some version of it. Uh, with the most recent expansion, we learn a lot about the Exos, and how Clovis Bray had set up these uh, obstacle courses, more or less, for people who had been uploaded into an Exo body uh, that involved jumping the way only guardians can new, do nowadays so having different perks mm -hmm. for the races it was a, a no-brainer really yeah now when it comes now um when it comes to weapons because obviously given the kind of game destiny is weapons are going to be a big deal and the same applies here um now you now obviously within the sheet you have the you have three slots for weapons one for kinetic one for energy and one for um, power. Now, some something that I'm I was curious about was what is um what were the what were the design goals you had to make sure that individual weapons didn't fall into the trap of of what happens with a lot of RPGs where the where the main thing they determine is an attack mod and a damage die. Balancing the weapons into primary, uh, secondary, and uh, 
power weapons has been uh, an interesting challenge. And uh, having the, the kinetic and energy difference exist at the same time is an interesting uh, challenge to work around as well. The way I look at it right now, technically, energy weapons are slightly better than kinetic weapons because energy weapons get a plus one to shields there aren't many uh enemies in the bestiary that have shields so it doesn't come into play that often uh but because of the way the system works you can have a primary weapon in both kinetic and energy if you choose to uh the main difference between a, a primary weapon and a secondary weapon is ammo restrictions mm -hmm. uh if you look at the character sheet you've got uh, a specific amount of reserve ammo for secondary weapons. Uh, and uh, that's really where the, the balancing comes down, is the uh, the primary versus uh, secondary instead of uh, kinetic versus energy. Because anyone can put a shotgun uh, in energy or a shotgun in kinetic, and the only difference is that plus one to shields. Uh, but... You're also, uh, I mean, most of the time you're not customizing the gear you're picking up. Your speaker's telling you that you got a kinetic shotgun or a, an energy sniper rifle. And uh, balancing the perks, uh, because the perks are what make the gun. Every gun has a, a default perk. Uh, that's the, the real challenge in ammo economy. And when, and um, give... Given that now, I, when it came when it came to the Trinity of classes, there there, there was always this impl even though they're not class limited aside aside from the higher tier weapons, there was always this implicit implicit nature that cer that certain weapons were meant to be geared towards certain classes, like say, um, scout rifles being li implied to be for um, hunters. Um, Within that, within that, was there was there the temptation to make to make it so that um, certain cl certain classes lean towards certain weapons, or was that something you guys never had any intention to do? We never had any intention to do that. Uh, so much to the point that uh, even the abilities that are restricted to certain classes in game, uh, Destiny Two, like Warlocks, have the the rift that they can choose between empowering or healing. Uh, a titan or a hunter can do that in the tabletop role-playing game now. Mm -hmm. uh, it has always been about freeing up options instead of restricting further. Which is in which is interesting because, well, to be frank, the the trinity of hunt of titan, hunter, and warlock <coughs> is a all, for all intents and purposes a science fantasy spin on the warrior, rogue, mage trinity. Definitely. And within that, what would you say would be some would be some of the ways that that um that you've put that you've put a spin on the on the concept so that it isn't as obvious who's supposed to be the tank, who's supposed to be the DPS, and who's supposed to be the um, healer. Uh, in opening up uh, the abilities and leaving the weapons as open as uh, they were. Uh, Anybody can be can be the healer nowadays. Uh, it's clear still that warlocks have an advantage in abilities, uh, and they'll have less of an advantage in the near future. Mm -hmm. uh, hunters are better marksmen. Titans are better at shooting and providing cover, but they're not so much better that it overshadows the other classes. Uh, like I said, just because... Uh, the Titan is the one that specializes in punching. That doesn't mean you can't make a really well-functioning uh, Warlock that does all the melee manipulations and uh, does all the the hand-to-hand -hand combat because it works. It worked very clearly, very well. Yeah. Now, when it come when it comes to when it comes to the weapons, now I I realize that. Um, at the time, at uh, the time of this recording, unless I'm, unless I'm, unless I missed it somehow, the um, the ar the more detailed armory is not in the book yet, 
But I'm cu I'm curious because of how loot is a big deal in Destiny. If you guys have plans on cre on creating some sort of um some sort of random table for ge for generating new weapons. Or... Yeah, I have uh, I have plans on a table, uh, sort of. But the uh, the thing that we have decided on that's going to be a, a much bigger deal uh, that won't actually. I mean, we've started the framework on it, but I'm not a coder, so I don't uh, I don't know how progress is going on it. Uh, two of my moderators, uh, Chaz and X Anima Rebellio, are computer scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, they have agreed to making a program that we're going to put on the website uh, that will allow for randomly rolled loot then and there. You won't have to think about it at all. You won't have to roll any dice. You'll press a button and get a gun. And I'm I'm curious if you if if there's given how we mentioned that you that um that there are melee weapons that can be done with this set with this setup. Um do you pl do you plan on having some something similar when it comes to melee weapons? I do. Uh right now our focus is the 1.0 release. It's more or less just going to include what you'll find in the video game. Mm -hmm. So our melee weapon is restricted to sword, but we have three expansions, and I have uh, I'm bringing on extra hands to work on the expansions. Uh, one of the expansions is the tech uh, tech expansion, is what I keep calling it. Uh, it includes uh, rules for space combat, or it will eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, rules for space combat, rules for other uh, technological advancements, but it's also going to feature uh, an expanded armory list, which will include more melee weapons, more weapons in general. Uh, I saw from one of my moderators uh, a really cool concept uh, for a, a base weapon that makes everything into a magic weapon. That uses an intellect stat instead of an aim stat, which I I could see that getting used a lot by anybody playing Warlock. Yeah. Um. And since you meant since you mentioned um, space combat and and given how this is definitely going to be a combat centric this is always this is always going to be a combat centric approach. Something that I'm curious about is: Do you consider there there are some game to the way I put it, there are some games that very clearly lean towards theater of the mind style combat, and some games that lean towards um, grid based affairs. And there are some who can do who can do both. Where do where do you see Destiny in that sort of paradigm? Do you see this as a game that very much leans towards having a grid, having a having some sort of battle map, and and so on, or? do you see it more as um, in the head kind of thing? I think uh, this system works really well on a, a battle map, uh, on a grid, uh, but because we have the numbers for range, uh, we have uh, uh, all the aspects that you need to be able to picture a scene, uh, it can be played just as easily in theater of the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally favor the battle map, but I want this system to be as accessible as possible for everyone. So uh, even if you don't have a computer, even if you don't have a huge grid of paper lying around to draw a grid on, uh, I want you to be able to uh, sit down and enjoy Destiny, the tabletop role-playing game. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you don't have a computer and have access to the game, but... <laughs> <clears throat> Look, I have, That's a spiral. I, I um, I have seen I've seen I've seen people come up with interesting ways to work to work around issues. I'll put I'll put it that way. <laughs> um. Now, when it came, now, a lot of times, whenever a game has some sort of limited resource, players tend to go defensively with it tend to want to utilize it as little as po as little as possible or ho or fall into the trap of hoarding it for a rainy day even if that rainy day never comes yeah um has that happened when it comes to when it comes to abilities and ammo within um destiny or ha it or um has that not happened as much during playtesting 
it happens a lot more with abilities than it does with ammo. People are a lot more willing to go out uh, guns blazing with their shotguns and rocket launchers than they are willing to throw their grenades, uh, despite the fact that grenades are just as or more effective than a shotgun uh, in many of those situations. Uh, I don't think there is an easy way to change that kind of mindset in people, but uh, I don't necessarily think that it needs to be changed too much. I have I have my own get I have my own guesses, and some and some of this is a is a glorified way of me saying stealing notes from Thirteenth Age, <laughs> but I but in order to do that, I would need to do my own testing. Um, and it's it's not like it, it's not like I can't. It's just a matter of a lot of a lot on the plate as it as it is. Yeah. Oh, I hundred percent get that. Um. But some um. Something else that I w something else that I was I was curious about was the fact that for all intents and purposes, um, I the vibe that I get when I look at light points is very similar to um to uh, to an extra effort system that you see in a lot of games and this is the funny thing is once you step away from d20 you'll you'll see that the vast majority of games have some sort of oomph system as my uh, br as my brother calls it um shadowrun has edge world of darkness yeah. has willpower um uh, eclipse phase the has... has performance mm -hmm. i think or drama, drama dice is what the expanse uses. Yeah, um, I, th I think the if it's the expanse version I'm thinking of, I think that uses a modified version of the age system. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, because I have two. I have two. I have two RPGs that are adaptations of the expanse. One is one is the official one that uses the age system, and the other one is a fan made one that uses Genesis. Uh, so, they t they can get kind of confusing in my head. Um, I understand. But w was with um light points was that was that born from wanting to have an extra effort system or just wanting to have something to make the dice a little less cut and dry? The light points were born of, uh, specifically making abilities function uh, the way they're implied to work. Uh, an extra effort system, I can kind of see them uh, working in that direction, mm -hmm. uh, but mechanically getting the abilities to work, uh, because our whole book is based on the lore of the world and not necessarily how the world works uh, in the code, you'll see Guardians... Like Ikora, who throws two Nova Bombs, which I would never have happen at my table unless you had some sort of special artifact. Uh, the ability to throw these abilities around and then you wind up without the, the pool to rely on. You wind up uh, relying on whatever ammo you can dredge up. That was where the, the light points were born from. And they were uh, originally a, a lot smaller pool. Mm -hmm. uh, Abilities cost one to three light points back in yonder day. Uh, and, th and then we uh, decided that different abilities were uh, worth more than other abilities that cost the same because of the size of the pool. So we uh, made the pool theoretically bigger, uh, made the number bigger at least, so that we could charge different things for abilities uh, make some one point abilities that were more throw away and some five point abilities that uh damaged whole groups of enemies at once that uh, but I could see it being adapted into one of those sorts of systems mm -hmm. now obviously where there where there's light there is darkness and yes that that brings me to the, to the to the concept of the darkness, and specifically, in the video game, you have um, you have in, you have areas that are that are high darkness, i.e., where where bigger threats or where layers are, and you're and 
you can't just re you can't just respawn in the same way. You have to go you have to go from a certain checkpoint in game. But when it comes to when it comes to having the darkness within the tabletop game, how how what were some of the ways you guys um, chose to represent that? Uh, so the way it works in the tabletop role playing game is uh, you still have darkness zones, uh, zones where the light can't get through uh, quite as easily. Uh, they are represented by the lack of ability to generate light over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so normal guardians, even during uh, just about during their day, after an hour of, uh, of time, downtime or not, you'll regain a light point. But in a darkness zone, you could spend an unlimited amount of time down there and never have to worry about uh reviving is a, a different thing for the tabletop game than the video game in that there when you die uh you can still be resurrected by your ghost and an ally can still come pick you up uh but if everybody dies that's it that's lights out that's a tpk mm -hmm. which real life doesn't have checkpoints which definitely definitely makes sense, especially since when you look at the lore, there's much much like with the Spart much like with the Spartans in Halo, for all of their abilities, they tend to have a very high body count. Yeah. Um. Now I I know. I know that you I know that you said that you that you designed this with um, with. Player with um people who are more familiar with video games and with tabletop games in in mind, but I'm curious if there were if there are any other games besides Fate slash Fudge that served as inspiration for how you wanted to take things. Yeah, we we've had a lot of inspirations from a lot of uh, different directions. Uh, mm -hmm. Steven's first role playing game was Five E Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, he's got a lot of other experience since then. He's played a lot of tabletop role-playing games. I've played a lot of tabletop role-playing games. and uh, So there are a lot of directions we could take things. I uh, tend to be more in favor of making tables uh, for a lot of things, and he doesn't care for the tables so much. Uh, he likes to keep things simple. Uh, so there have been a lot of discussions as per different directions to take a lot of things that we... Uh, because this system was built from the ground up, we use the the fate fudge dice, but we don't use the fate fudge, uh, the fate system. Mm -hmm. uh, we're taking inspiration from everything. We're taking inspiration from each other. We're taking inspiration from the community, and it definitely wouldn't be the project that it is without our community. I believe a wise man once said, "If you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen people, it's research." Exactly. And. With that, with that kind, with that kind of thing in in mind, um, now you meant you mentioned planning um, space combat, and I could also see vehicular combat um, being some, being something that gets touched upon or expanded in the future. Because, well, what's the yeah. point? Of, what's the point of having that? What's the point of having so many sweet rides if you can't shoot something in them? Exactly. I mean, ev everybody. I don't know about I don't know about you, but everybody wanted one of those speed one of those speeder bikes after seeing Return of the Jedi. <laughs> oh yeah, everybody in Destiny gets a sparrow, but the Fallen ride around on pikes, which can shoot and go fast and shoot mines, and the the Cabal ride around on their interceptors, which have uh, basically cannons on either side of them, and everybody wants one of those instead of a sparrow. Uh, so, vehicle combat is definitely intended for that expansion as well. And when it the thing I could see tricky when introducing vehicle combat, and I'm get, and I'm guessing this is something that's been discussed internally, is how to do how to do how to make vehicle combat still interesting while not doing it on a um, grid, because that's something I can see being tricky. Yeah, uh, it is definitely a conversation we've had a, a number of times internally, mm -hmm. uh, and 
what I'm going to wind up doing is we're going to play test a bunch of different systems that all have space combat. We're going to uh, sit down and, and take turns running systems that have space combat to get a feel for how everybody else does it. We're going to take inspiration from everywhere mm. uh, for that, just like we do for everything else. Although I did have a really dumb idea in, as a spur of the as a spur of the moment kind of thing regarding vehicular combat, um, you've probably seen at least one of the Mad Max movies, right? Oh, definitely. Then I think you know. I think you can figure out where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, I uh, I think it would be a whole lot of fun. I actually have uh, a strike that I've written up. That is a train heist mm -hmm. where everybody's supposed to ride in on their sparrows from either side of the, the moving train and uh, board and stop it, mm -hmm. uh, which will definitely be enhanced by this concept of uh, vehicle combat because theoretically players don't even have to board the train in order to stop it at that point. But uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited for what the future holds. And uh, I know I talk a lot about the... Uh, expansions i talk about mm -hmm. the the tech expansion we've got a darkness expansion uh also planned that'll be worked on at the same time uh and we've got uh, a playable enemies expansion that we're going to be working on at the same time as the other two because i'm making the team bigger uh uh it's all gonna stay just as accessible i don't want anything to be held behind any sort of obstruction to keep people from playing and enjoying the whole mm -hmm. system and since you mentioned the playable enemies thing, I'm guessing I'm guessing that's for people who want who want to play as as one of the races that is that that is affiliated with the darkness, but could possibly be could possibly go through some sort of redemption arc or something like that. The way I see the playable enemies expansion is uh, setting up race blocks like we have for our guardians right now: mm -hmm. the Exo, the Awoken, and the humans. Uh, expanding on that, but also uh, allowing for not being gifted by the light or the dark, starting as a thrall and, and growing uh, in power to an acolyte and then choosing to grow into a, a knight or a wizard, mm -hmm. uh, which will lead you to war priest or death singer, growing through the ranks of straight up enemy territory, maybe running against humanity. Which is is um de is definitely interesting and and plus with with that sort of thing since I since we mentioned the um, houses with the fallen that's one good that's one good way to introduce good to introduce good old madness also known as oh, politics. Yeah. Politics are an important part of any tabletop world because that's how you get around the government <clears throat> and that's how you get around the field of battle. If you're in a situation where you need to surrender, you better hope the politics are on your side. Well, I'm, I mainly bring up that that kind of thing beca because of I play a lot of Warhammer Fantasy, and there's always the meme of orc and Skaven politics. Namely, if namely if you haven't gotten backstabbed at least three t at least three times before breakfast, you're pro you're pro someone's probably poisoned your lunch. Yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm really excited to see the direction that things go in the future and where mm -hmm. players decide to take yeah. the things that we give them and what what prompted doing the what prompted doing the live streams of the play test that you've been doing <clears throat> since I uh, since I first found out about the project uh, the live streams were uh, a sword uh, that worked for two directions for me uh, the first was dr uh, drumming up attention, getting people uh, to notice the project, getting mm -hmm. people who were uh, interested in playing and uh, exploring the Destiny universe. Uh, and it was also a playtesting thing, uh, because I can take my players through from a campaign start to finish. Uh, I can experience a lot of things that I wouldn't get in a, a single playtesting session, where we sat down to do a one-shot of the system. And I learned a lot of valuable information about the system in those live stream playtesting sessions. Uh, if you watch back on the YouTube channel, uh, you'll see several points throughout the campaign where I stop and say that I'm taking a note of something because it's busted or could use some work. It's just that 
that definitely makes sense. Now, besides the besides the expansions that you that you mentioned and the for, and the forthcoming um, 1.0 version when that event when that eventually comes around. First off, what when do you what do you see as the release window for the next update? And second, aside from the expansions that we mentioned earlier, what sort of things can people look forward to in the f in the future from from your particular pipeline? Uh, <clears throat> release window for the next update. Uh, publicly, I'm telling everybody that it should be ready by April. I'm hoping for it to be ready well earlier than that, but. Uh, the world is corrupted by a plague at the moment, and so things don't always go according to plan. That's why I put the uh, the window so far out there. Uh, following that update, the update after that should be 1.0, uh, because I'm going to be mostly just looking at the things that I changed and maybe tweaking a couple of things. So I'm hoping for a full release by the end of the summer, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even earlier. Uh Things specifically coming from my pipeline. <coughs> uh, I've got a lot that I'm looking at. I'm uh, very excited about a, a number of things. I uh, I privately challenged uh, some people who have been running games to write a uh, a proper module for people to follow if if they wanted to. Uh, so that may or may not be something that is being developed mm -hmm. uh, by the community, for the community. Uh, but I will have my hands in each of the expansions, as well as having uh, people dedicated to each expansion. So there will always be work going on. There will always be things to look forward to. Uh, I am personally most excited for the playable enemies expansion because I am uh, I have a lot of really good ideas about basically developing each race into a class uh, of their own but I'm also excited for the darkness expansion which will include all the new subclasses that Bungie puts out uh, like the, the stasis subclass using ice that they uh, put out recently uh, and whatever comes in the near future uh, or the tech expansion with the space combat and the, the vehicle combat and the expanded armory. Uh, my favorite weapon of all time, including medieval or modern weaponry, is the halberd. Uh, so you can definitely expect to see pole arms in that weapon ex expansion. Oh, now you're speaking my language. Especially since I could easily see somebody, d somebody um, deciding, you know what? We need a gun on a stick. Yeah. <laughs> or a stick on a gun. Who knows? Um, I don't. I don't know. Maybe we. Can, maybe we can find some way to do a Destiny version of the of the legendary can cannon. Oh yeah. <laughs> that would be really cool. You know, just just to just to dispel just to dispel the old story of having shotguns be very close range exclusively. Yeah. And so uh, there's there's a lot to look forward to. Oh yeah. Well, with with that in, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show, a, even through braving the hell of time zones, and enjoy the um, insanity at play here. <laughs> I have had nothing but a good time. Your monastery is very homey and welcoming. Oh, well, that's what is what I like to do. As I always say around here, drinking is not mandatory in the temple, but it is encouraged. When in doubt, fuck it. When not in doubt, get in doubt. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I may have I may have to steal that. Do it. But and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of uh, their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Don't be a stranger.